Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Good morning. Welcome to the First Church of Christ in Hartford, Connecticut, Center Church. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Are there any announcements for the good of the body? sunny outside. It's really cold, but come on, wake up, church. <laughs> Finally, we are pleased to announce, it's hard to say her name. <laughs> uh, Reverend Elizabeth Arulampalam. Arulampalam has consented to be our pastor, and we await our candidate in wait weekend so that our congregation can vote her in. She's a lovely woman. Everybody that took place and helped us with this, we appreciate that. And we're gonna further appreciate when the church votes her in. Tell us all about it. Yes, and so if you are in person and want to take this home for reference, there is copies of this that you either got when you came in. Um, hopefully if you're virtual, you can see it on the screen. But Reverend Elizabeth Arulampalam, uh, she goes by Liza. She holds degrees from Emory University and Yale Divinity School. Liza grew up in a UCC church, was ordained by the American Baptist Church, and now has dual standing in both denominations. In addition to currently pastoring two churches, Liza has worked in a variety of ministry contexts, including middle and high schools in New Haven and Hartford International University. Liza is one of the founding clergy of the Greater Hartford Interfaith Action Alliance and is passionate about interfaith work, racial justice, and teaching the rich stories of Jesus to disciples of all ages. She serves as the clergy representative to the Hartford Police Accountability Review Board and, along with her husband, Arunan, has lived in the Frog Hollow neighborhood of Hartford for almost seven years. Together they are busy with one crazy dog and five children, ages one through eight, who came to them through birth, foster care, and adoption. We are so excited. Um, we're hoping to have a candidate weekend, March 13th? No. 13th? 13th. Um, I, yes, that There's one. There's a three in there, but it's 13th. <laughs> 13th, um, and have her start in May, and more info will come about the candidating process as we get a little closer to that. So thank you. Five kids faith formation. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. We're super, super excited about Liza. She's um, an awesome candidate, and thank you all so much um, for your prayers, support, from, and your patience through what has been a long process. And we're really excited that Liza has been led to us. So, thank you all. Are there any other announcements for the good of the body? I will share two. If you've been reading the church newsletter, you know that we have some events coming up in March and April. The book talk with Terry Stokes, Prayers for the People, Things We Didn't Know We Could Say to God, that is March 9th. Online, we ask that you register for that. People are registering not only from the church, but also from the area and other parts of the country. TJ will be in conversation with our own Stephen Lewis. And then March 23rd, March 30th, and April 6th, our lecture series with Lawrence Anglin, Slavery, Subjugation, and Freedom in Christianity. You'll want to register for that also. Hartford International University for Religion and Peace has promoted both of these events, and people are signing up not only from Connecticut, but from around the world online already. So if you would like to be a part of that, please sign up. We look forward to those events. If there aren't any other announcements, we now move to the passing of the peace, and we encourage you to greet each other verbally or by a friendly wave of peace. I begin by saying to all, the peace of the Lord be with you. Good morning. 
Please join me in the call to worship. Come near to one another and to our God. Be still before the one who fulfills our heart's desires. Wait patiently, for God will be revealed to us. God is our refuge in whom we trust. We are here to receive life in all its abundance. God is providing for us and has a purpose for us. Now our invocation, please pray with me. Loving God, you bring light to our days and hope to our hearts. We draw near to you as survivors of another week, grateful for your care. You have provided for us, preserved our lives, and invited us once more to this time of prayer. Now we would be still before you, leaving behind our distress and anger, entrusting our weaknesses to your empowering spirit. Raise us up to embrace your way of love. Amen. Amen. the children to come forward for the children's message. Come on up, boys and girls. Come on up. Come and sit on the sit right here in front of me. There you go. Super duper. Here, oh my goodness, we're all here today. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good. Good. Who knows what this is? This is a heart, 
And tell me that when you see a heart, what do you think of? Valentine's, Valentine's Day. What? Love. love. That's right. Let me ask you something. Who do you love? Who do you love? My mom. You love your mom. Do you love your brothers and sisters? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> it's honest. Honesty. Love it. How about you? Do you love your sisters? Maybe. Oh, okay, we got a little work to do on that one. You love your teachers? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Do you love your neighbor? Yes. Okay. So it's good to have people we love, isn't it? What would happen if we had somebody we didn't love so much? Somebody that would be like an enemy. Who has an enemy? Does anybody have an enemy? Oh, you do? Already? Oh, boy. It starts early. So what if somebody at school was really mean to you? What would you do? What would you do? I actually have no idea. You don't know what you would do if somebody was no, mean? No, I, I actually have it, and I actually know somebody at school that's, that's mean, and um, hmm. be quiet. <laughs> yeah. So you do have someone that's mean to you at school, and you don't know what to do about it, huh? Can I talk about what we might consider doing about things like that? I know what I would do. What would you do? He said he would stop to say, tell them stop, and if they keep doing it, to tell the teacher. That's one solution. That is a solution, actually. But what does it make you feel like inside when you have an enemy, somebody that you don't like? What does that make you feel? Hurt. Hurt. What else? Sad. And, and Jesus said, well, there's another way. Yes, it's good to do things like that. Sometimes we can just be quiet, but we're still feeling sad inside, aren't we, when somebody is our enemy? So here's a suggestion that Jesus said. I'm going to read to you from the Bible. And it says this. In his sermon, Jesus said some things that really surprised people, and this is what he said. I have heard that you should love your neighbors and hate your enemies, and Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies, and if someone is mean and hateful, you pray for them. Ooh, now that's different. Now, not only should you, could you go to your teacher and say something to your teacher, but God says, Jesus said to pray for them. And so, I have a question. Why do you think Jesus said that, and why should we love our enemies? Why? What? Because it's not good to have hate in your heart. It's not good to have hate in your heart. Did you hear that, Brother Eric? It's not good to have hate in your heart. That's right. We carry that around, and we feel sadder, more sad. So when we pray, it's a way for us to say, Dear Jesus, please take care of this person and take care of me so that there's no anger and no hatred because that's not the way God wants us to live our lives. We are to love our enemies in a way that God will take care of them. Sometimes you can't take care of them, but God can, okay? So let's remember that. And there's reasons that we do that. One is that when we act we pray and we're kind to them, it demonstrates how God loves us. And it also sets a good example. And it turns sometimes, sometimes we can turn an enemy into a friend, especially when we're kind and we pray for them. That, that's, that, that's the work of God in them. And so let's pray together and we'll be ready to go to Sunday school. Okay, you ready? Dear God, it is easy to love those who love us. Help us to love our enemies so that they might know that we are your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go to Sunday school. You ready? Before we do that, though. Whoa, we got something else. Can we, can we do a, a, a children's song? Absolutely. Let's do it. Too? Let's do it. Can I have the seat? You can have the right. seat. Hey, kiddos, why don't you gather around? We're gonna sing. We're gonna sing a song called "This Is the Day." Okay. Here. Actually, here. scoot over here. Okay. And I think I think. Hey, Tristan and John Luke, you know this song, right? 
right? You know how to do it. So if, if you want to sing along, you can. You just repeat after me. You follow Tristan and Jean-Luc, and they'll show you how to do it, okay? Ready? Just before we have our scripture reading, we will, have, we will just have a short prayer for illumination. And so I invite you now to pray with me. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Genesis uh, chapter 45, verses 3 to 11 and 15. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me, and they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed, or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. 
So, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children, and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Our New Testament reading is from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 31. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. May these words be a blessing for our hearts and minds. Good morning again. And welcome to all who have joined us. Scripture tells us that where two or three are gathered in God's name, God is there with them. And in our day and age, yes, as we continue to grapple with the realities of COVID-19, pandemic, endemic, whatever we want to call it, that includes meeting both in person and live streaming. So today we are all assembled here in the presence of the Lord. Now, meditate with me for a few minutes while I share a message entitled, Enemy Mine. Enemy Mine. Anyone who knows me knows that I am an aficionado of 1980s pop culture, especially science fiction movies. If you follow my Facebook, you will see a number of posts that verify this with the hashtag I am an 80s kid. The film Enemy Mine, starring Louis Gossett Jr. and Dennis Quaid, was released in 1985 and is about conflict between people groups or species. Two representatives of the groups in conflict, the humans and the Drax, are stranded on a planet and must work together to survive. Mistrust and unforgiveness gives way to trust and cooperation, and one species ends up preserving the other by the film's end. The film, especially its title, immediately came to mind when I read this week's lectionary scriptures, especially when I read the Old Testament texts. I gave my sermon the same title, Enemy Mine, in response. Our Old Testament text is part of the larger story of Joseph, and his story is perhaps my favorite in the Bible. The verses we read this morning are from the latter part of his story. However, I do not think we can really appreciate the narrative unless we know how Joseph and his brothers arrived at such a significant moment. To gain a fuller picture, we must travel back in time at least one decade earlier to learn what brought them to the events detailed in our text. I will not recount all the details for you, 
but you can read about them beginning in Genesis 37. There we meet the 17-year-old Joseph, who eventually becomes the person of power we see in chapter 45. Joseph is one of 12 sons of Jacob, the eldest of the two born to his wife and soulmate, Rachel. He is Joseph's highly favored son, the one to whom he, Jacob, he is Jacob's highly favored son, the one to whom he gave the fabled coat of many colors, Genesis 37, 3 through 4. Joseph, the son, has a dream about his own greatness, shares the dream with his brothers and father, and that's where the problems begin. His dream did not cause his brothers to experience awe and joy at its possible interpretations. Instead, it prompted them to embrace the jealousy already in their hearts, and they plotted to kill him. Joseph's dream was about his brothers and his fathers bowing to him in respect. Instead of killing him because they had plotted in their hearts to kill him, his brothers trick him and sell him into slavery and then tell their father that he had been killed while shepherding in the fields. Jacob, Joseph's father's grief was inconsolable and Joseph unknowingly embarked on an amazing journey from the slaver's pit that would end in the Egyptian palace. In the intervening years between the beginning of his story and its conclusion in Genesis 45, Joseph endures much. He is purchased by an Egyptian state official, becomes the chief steward of that household, is falsely accused of committing a violent crime against the official's wife. He is then thrown into prison where his administrative and spiritual gifts blossom and is ultimately brought before the Pharaoh of Egypt, interpreting Pharaoh's seemingly undecipherable dreams and is made one of the country's leaders in return. Joseph's is a fantastic story with twists and turns that rival those experienced by the Baudelaire siblings in Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. The ending is quite moving, as recorded in Genesis 45 and 46, but there is more for us to consider. Joseph's story provides us with an example of how we may engage our enemies, resist the temptation to exact vengeance when we are wronged, and promote the greater good through forgiveness. To be clear, Joseph's brothers were his enemies, and they had done him much harm. I have often wondered what went through his mind when they first abducted and plotted to do him harm. The first 17 years of Joseph's life were spent with his brothers in close proximity. They bounced him on their knees, played games with him, taught him how to hunt, and they taught him how to care for a flock. I imagine these memories flooded Joseph's mind when he went hurtling down into the slaver's pit and re remained with him throughout his sojourn in Egypt. His brothers had become his enemies, and the pain caused by, by their betrayal most certainly was great. I think this is one of the hard things we must deal with in life, disappointment and betrayal by the people who are closest to us. The pain caused by that kind of injury from those closest to us is a different kind of pain. Sadly, I have experienced this pain in my life and I am certain others in my listening audience have experienced it too. Dr. Shira Olson, a clinical psychologist based in Washington State, discusses five reasons why betrayal hurts us so deeply. One, betrayal is relational. Two, betrayal threatens our instincts. Three, Betrayal is traumatic. Four, betrayal is confusing. And five, betrayal feels personal. Anyone who has experienced the deep hurt caused by personal betrayal can identify with Dr. Olson's indices, and I believe Joseph could identify with them too. We are all challenged with the question of how to handle personal injuries, offenses, and assaults in our lives. From the youngest to the eldest among us, we experience hurt and pain, sometimes at the hands of the people we love and respect the most. What do we do with that hurt? Do we simply hold on to it throughout our lives and run the risk of being consumed by unforgiveness and bitterness? What do we do when the people who have caused us harm have been absent from our lives for years and through an unexpected turn of events wind up standing before us? Do we take revenge? Do we forgive? Do we do nothing at all? These are hard questions we should ask ourselves because our witness as Christians mandates 
forgiveness, and I believe reconciliation where possible. I think this is where our Old Testament and New Testament texts come together in my message today. In Luke 6, Jesus is teaching his disciples truths about God's kingdom. His lesson plan, if you will, includes a discourse on the importance of loving their enemies. Jesus' words in these verses have been immortalized and in some ways trivialized, I feel, by placing them under a moniker known around the world as the Golden Rule. We have all heard these words and or read them in various forms of media over the years. Do unto others as you would have them do to you, Luke 6, 31. These words sound wonderful, but they are incomplete without the verses that precede them in the chapter. We can only do unto others as we would have them do to us as much as we love our enemies. Do good to those who hate us. Bless those who curse us and pray for those who abuse us. Revisiting Luke 6, 27 through 29. I believe the golden rule encompasses all these sayings and for the Christian provides a pathway for how we are to live, engage our loved ones, our enemies, and navigate the larger world. Now, if I were to stand here and say that all of this could be done effortlessly, effortlessly and easily, I would be lying to you. The pain some of us have experienced at the hands of people who were supposed to have our best interests at heart is significant. The thought of facing them again and reliving the trauma of the moment of injury and the related effects is daunting. Yet, I believe God has a way of bringing things full circle in ways that are challenging and best for everyone involved. It's in those moments when we must rely on God's grace to help us follow the golden rule in its entirety. Joseph has one of these full circle moments in our Old Testament text. Years after his betrayal, Joseph comes face to face with the same people who had injured him so grievously. A famine had impacted the entire region for several years, and Joseph's brothers, acting as envoys for their father, come to Egypt in search of grain. Their inquiries bring them directly before Joseph, whom they do not recognize. He recognizes them and must decide what he is going to do next. Will the pain of their injury cause him to act in vengeance, or will he live out what we have come to know as the golden rule? I believe it was a difficult decision for Joseph, and it may have been a difficult one for many, if not all, of us. He, Joseph, chooses the latter, and after a series of tests, is reconciled with his brothers. The tests are clever and recorded in detail in Genesis 42 through 44. Joseph's brothers pass his tests, demonstrating to him that they had matured and changed over the years. And at the end, Joseph's entire family is reunited. His sons, born in Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim, have opportunities to meet their grandfather Jacob and their uncles and their extended family members. And in addition, the lives of many were saved from extinction during famine. Joseph realized that what his brothers had originally meant for evil, God meant for good. And he was able to extend forgiveness and in doing so, preserve the lives of many. In conclusion, I think there's much for us to learn from Joseph's story when we consider it in conjunction with Jesus' teaching in Luke 6. We all have or will experience serious injury from people we know and love. Jesus has said to all of us that offenses and injuries will come. He makes those statements in Luke 17, 1. We must acknowledge what has been done to us and that we have been hurt. Yet, when the opportunity arises for us to offer forgiveness and reconcile, if possible, we should take it. As Christians, we need to live the golden rule fully, doing unto others as we would have them do unto us in a variety of situations. Christ calls for us to be his witnesses in the earth, loving, forgiving, and caring for our enemies, and living into the ministry of reconciliation to which we have all been called, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Amen.
moving now into a time of prayer, and I would ask, as we have engaged these past few months, are there any prayer concerns that the body would like to make known at this time? If there are silent requests, and you would like just for us to keep things in mind or keep you in mind, you can raise your hand if you don't want to say anything. So again, several silent requests. Thank you. Please pray with me. Gracious God, as you spoke your creative word in the beginning, as you spoke through prophets and teachers, as you spoke through evangelists and apostles, so you still speak to us today. You speak to us words of invitation to live into your abundant mercy. You speak to us inviting us to seek your thoughts and live your love. You speak to us inviting us to delight in your grace freely given to us and all creation. Knowing that your love is sure, knowing your covenant is steadfast, knowing your peace, send us out as your church, O God, as we join you in your ongoing transformation of the world. Where drumbeats of war and violence rage, may we sound the harmonies of peace and hope. Peace that is deep and true and just. Peace that blends our voices into a mighty chorus of hope. Hope that inspires and transforms even the most desperate of situations and circumstances. Be with our congregation, O oh God. Continue to blend our voices and weave our lives together in ways beautiful, faithful, profound, and holy, the ways of Jesus. Blend our voices now with our spiritual forebearers who have gone before us and with disciples throughout the world as we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God, you call us to give as we have received. You call us to respond to your grace. Let our generosity express our gratitude for your goodness in our lives. We will now take the offer. We fall in deeper in love with you. You burn the truth of. 
Responsive. Love your enemies and do good. Lend to others, expecting nothing in return. As we want people to treat us, we commit ourselves to treat them. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. We want to forgive as God forgives us. We would be merciful as God is merciful. God will raise you up to new life. Be still before God and wait patiently each day. God, God is, is our refuge and our salvation. salvation. We, we recommit, recommit our ways to God, God together. Amen. Amen.